We've been doing a Lenten sermon series entitled Practice Makes Permanent, and you will see the title in the bulletin for this week is Practice Makes Permanent, Practicing Truth-Telling. Well, here's the truth. This week, I have written two funeral meditations and two-thirds of a sermon. And the sermon that uh, is on truth-telling is sort of like a casserole that needs some more time in the oven. Uh, Actually, it's more like a word salad right now. So I'm having to set that one aside, and we're going to take a different direction. We may come back to that one, but uh, this is just one of those weeks where the pastor needed two more days and did not have them. So I ask your forgiveness. And uh, we're going to preach on the, uh, the parables from Luke instead. Our lives are made immeasurably easier and much neater through the convenience of disposable items. Think of the list of everyday items that we use and then cast aside. Disposable diapers, very convenient. Enough to make a parent weep with gratitude while changing their child. Instead of dealing with a cloth diaper and having to rinse all of the direst olfactory offense away, store it in a diaper pail, launder it, fold it, and stack it, you simply go disposable, zip, strip, wipe, swipe, roll, fold, toss. (laughs) All much neater and much easier. Or imagine hosting a family reunion picnic. If you used china and glassware, you would be washing for hours. But if you used chinette, paper plates and plastic cups and cutlery, paper tablecloths, you can bundle the whole party up and into a trash bag in three minutes. Pack away the leftovers in disposable containers. We have disposable razors and disposable cameras, disposable ballpoint pens and paint tray liners, disposable medical items like tissues and plastic gloves. There's aluminum foil and aluminum pans and plastic beverage bottles, all designed to make our lives quick and easy, safe and sanitary, unburdened by unnecessary inconvenience. And if you Google the word disposable, which I did as a research for the preceding paragraphs, and you look at the images, all of the pictures are so neat, so clean, so tidy. Images of pure, sterile, antiseptic ease. You look at the page of immaculate images and you just go, ah. Then Google the word landfill and look at the consequences. How many disposable diapers, how many picnics, how many razors and ballpoint pens, disposable cameras, batteries, mounds upon mounds upon mountains of what we have cast off or cast aside. You get the picture. Disposable is neat and clean and convenient and simple. Disposed is where it gets messy. Disposed is the consequence of disposable. But as long as we don't have to deal with disposed, as long as it's out of my sight and out of my mind, as long as the landfill is not in my backyard, I don't need to observe the consequences, and life is good. Now, this could be a very serviceable recycling rant or stewardship sermon, but it's actually not why I began in this fashion. Though, what the heck, do look up pictures of landfills before you throw your next aluminum drink can in the garbage. But for now, just hold those two distinct images in your mind, disposable in all of its clean, simple convenience, and disposed in all of its messy reality. And then in your mind's eye, replace all those inanimate objects that I named with people, disposable people disposed people. Who makes life messy and inconvenient for us? Who is it neater or tidier or easier for us to label and then discard? 
And where are the landfills where we dump the messy, inconvenient people? Prisons, housing projects, deportation centers. It's cleaner if there's a place that isn't in our backyard to dispose of disposable people. Now, if we get down to the bottom line, that's what our scripture lesson is about. The scribes and the Pharisees would assert that some people are disposable. We have terms for the type of people they mean. Dirtbag, loser, punk, outcast, untouchable, trash. The sort of people that you should wash your hands before eating. And in our scripture lesson, the sort of people you should wash your hands of before eating. Do not eat people. In our scripture lesson, rather than washing his hands of them, Jesus is eating with them. And the Pharisees are indignant. You're judged by the company you keep, Jesus. If you lie down with dogs, you wake up with fleas, Jesus. How can you call yourself godly or speak of God or of God's kingdom when you associate with these types of people? Now, the Pharisees are not completely inhuman. If a person were to, say, climb out of the trash heap and clean himself up, get her act together, well, that's a horse of a different color. That would make the person a success story. We love rags to riches, up from the bottom, good old bootstrap success stories. All they need to do to be touched is to deserve it or to earn it. But until they do, they're untouchable. You don't go to them, Jesus. They can come to you when they get their stuff together. The Pharisees are acting like God's gatekeepers, bouncers for the kingdom of heaven. You're in, you're in, you can stay, you can stay, you're out, you're out, you're outcast. And Jesus seeing their grumbling and their disgruntlement, says, that is not the nature of God. God does not do disposable. And God doesn't wait for people to clean themselves up and come looking for God. God comes looking for us. The one who is most precious to God the object of God's urgency and the subject of God's concern is precisely the one who is apart or missing or cast aside. There are no acceptable losses to God. No one who doesn't matter. No one who has worn out their usefulness. No one who is irredeemable or irretrievable or irrevoc irrevocably irrecoverable. No one whose value is diminished. In fact, it is the very nature of God to be most concerned about the least and the lost. Now, a brief aside. When I say lost. I don't mean morally lost or deficient or broken. And I don't mean theologically lost as in if you haven't prayed the sinner's prayer that's in this tract, then you're lost. I think we're way bigger prudes than God is. And I think we're a lot quicker to damn and discard people than God is. When I say lost, I simply mean people who feel as they have been made to feel who view themselves as disposable or dispensable or having no value. They are the ones upon whom the heart of God is fixed. And to illustrate his point, Jesus tells two parables. And you'll notice in the telling that he uses two economic images, a sheep and a coin. We aren't a culture of farmers and shepherds, by and large, so we might think of a lost sheep as a lost animal or a lost pet. To a shepherd, it's lost inventory. It does not cease to have value when it disappears from the herd. How many sheep is it okay to lose? 
one, two, dozen? What kind of shepherd writes sheep off, Jesus asks. Or what woman, having ten silver coins, if she loses one, says, at least I still have nine. She doesn't sit and stare at the nine in her hand and admire how clean and shiny they are and curse the one for falling out of the purse. She lights a lamp and she starts moving furniture and she starts sweeping the room and she gets down on her hands and her knees in the dirt if she has to. Why? Because the nine coins in the purse represent only a part of her investment. The lost coin did not diminish in her attention when it rolled away. It became the focus of her attention. And that's how God is with us, Jesus says. We don't lose value when we become lost or when we feel lost. We become more precious to God. Years ago, before I had children, I read a column by Irma Bombeck, and even without having children, I knew it was true. It's brief enough and important enough to share in its entirety. Every mother has a favorite child, Bombeck writes. She cannot help it. She's only human. I have mine. The child for whom I feel a special closeness, with whom I share a love that no one else could possibly understand. My favorite child is the one who was too sick to eat ice cream at his birthday party, the one who had measles at Christmas, the one who wore leg braces to bed because he towed in, the one who had a fever in the middle of the night, the asthma attack, the child in my arms at the emergency ward. My favorite child spent Christmas alone away from the family, was stranded after the game with a gas tank on empty, lost the money for his class ring. My favorite child is the one who messed up at the piano recital, misspelled committee in a spelling bee, ran the wrong way with the football and had his bike stolen because he was careless. My favorite child is the one I punished for lying grounded for insensitivity to others' feelings, and informed he was a royal pain to the entire family. My favorite child slammed the doors in frustration, cried when she didn't think I saw her, withdrew, and said she could not talk to me. My favorite child always needed a haircut, had hair that wouldn't curl, had no date for Saturday night, and a car that cost $600 to fix. My favorite child was selfish, immature, bad-tempered, and self-centered. He was vulnerable, lonely, unsure of what he was doing in the world, and quite wonderful. All mothers have their favorite child, and it's always the same one. The one who needs you at that moment. Who needs you for whatever reason cling to, to shout at, to hurt, to hug, to flatter, to reverse charges to, to unload on, but mostly just to be there. Our scripture lesson assures us that long before Irma Bombeck wrote that column, God wrote that column. And about that business of having to clean yourself up, find your way back, earn or deserve God's attention, Look once more at the imagery that Jesus uses. A coin will never, ever, 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 ever find its way back, earn its way back, or climb its way back into a purse. It is dependent entirely upon the ceaseless diligence of the woman. And sheep are not cats. They don't wander off and eventually wander back. More often than not, when sheep are lost, they hide. It's a way of self-protection. And they don't bleat in distress, they go quiet. They will curl up, lie down in the thickest, densest tangle of brush that they can find and freeze there, immobilized. And the way the sheep gets out of that brush 
is that the shepherd goes into the brush and seeks it out and carries it out. God doesn't need bouncers, Jesus tells the Pharisees and us. God needs searchers. God needs tenders. God needs lovers. God needs healers. God needs binders of wounds and dryers of tears and feeders of hungry folks. What kind of shepherd willingly discards a lost sheep? What kind of person willingly writes off a lost coin? What kind of parent ever stops obsessing about a lost child? QED. Therefore, what type of God has disposable people? No God I know. Amen.